And of course, both can be quite charming with women. Vautrin uh, winds around his little finger, Madame Vauquin, Madame Vauquet, the KG proprietor of the pension where he lives, and uh, Charlus charms the narrator's grandmother just with a few phrases. They also, the way they behave with young men is very similar. By that I mean that the seeds of seduction, they do not succeed. In the case of Vautrin, the, uh, the seduction of Rastignac, and in the case of Charlus, that of the narrator, are very similar. In the case of Vautrin, it is the older man that approaches Rastignac and offers to make his fortune by way of a terrifying scheme that involves a murder, while Rastignac never, never, never asked him for anything. Of course, Rastignac refuses, but remains all his life very much afraid of Vautrin. And if you remember the bizarre scene between the narrator and Charlus after the evening in the Guermont, where Charlus sort of dangles the possibility of a fantastic ascent in society, while well, the, narrator, the narrator also never dreamed of asking the slightest favor of him. Uh, but he, uh, the narrator is sort of taken aback by Charlus's violence and his exorbitant demands. Now, as if to tease the reader, at this point, Proust alludes to Balzac and says, uh, and has uh, Charlus say to the narrator, what one cannot do by oneself in this life, because there are things which one cannot ask, nor do, nor wish, nor learn by oneself, one can do in company and without needing to be 13, as in Balzac's story. He refers here to Ferragus, which deals with murderous revenges, and not surprisingly, the poor narrator literally runs away, absolutely terrified. Proust goes very far in conjuring the image of Vautrin while describing Charlus in his most furious moments. The snakes of foam and spray, the olive-colored bilious juice that seemed to spit out of Charlus's mouth when the narrator obtuseness exasperates him, evoke Vautrin's awful streams of saliva when he's seized by the police. However, the resemblances between the two characters remain superficial. Their inner selves are completely different. One has the impression that Proust took the outer envelope of Vautrin and poured in it a very different man. The rages of Charlus are not the expression of his nature. He sort of works up to them because he wants to impress his in interlocutors. But deep inside, who is Charlus? Charlus is an old, sentimental lady who adores literature, who likes books. That's what he really is. And that is absolutely, and that is the way the narrator's a grandmother sees him the first time she meets him. She found in Monsieur Charles a delicacy, a sensibility that were quite feminine. And his sister-in-law, Oriane, describes him as having the heart of a woman. C'est un cœur de femme, mimi. Books are really important to him. And while he likes to, uh, he likes to see, uh, he likes to identify with characters, sometimes in jest. For instance, when he plays at being Louis XIV, as seen by Saint Simon. Sometimes, very fleetingly, uh, he identifies with Vautrin when Vautrin takes a very nostalgic walk around Rastignac's chateau. There, Charlus sees himself at Vautrin. But the character, the Balzac character, with which he has the most affinities, is a woman. And it's a woman who is the princess of Cadignan, the heroine of a novella called The, Princess, the Secrets of the Princess of Cadignan. I'll tell you the story briefly, because it is not very well known. The princess is a woman who had a lot of, of adventures, of love affairs when she was young. And she led to ruin many an admirer. She retires when she re reaches middle age, which in Balzac's conception is 30 years old. <laughs> and she has lost her fortune, but retained her beauty. And she falls in love with, 
she falls in love with a paragon of virtue, a writer called uh, Daniel D'Arthez. And she lives in fear, in fear that uh, he is going to learn about her past indiscretions. Now that is something that Charlus really identifies with. Because Charlus, Charlus does not uh, carry his homosexuality so lightly, and he is under the impression that nobody really knows about it. So the secrets of Princesse de Cadignan, he exclaims, what a masterpiece, how profound, how heartrending the evil reputation of Diane. Diane, of course, is the princess, who is afraid that the man she loves may hear of it. What an external truth, and more universal that might appear, how far it extends. Charles at the time was afraid that the family of Morel would learn about his, uh, his uh, tendencies and uh, might intervene if his habits were known. So he had begun to identify, says the narrator, his own position with that described by Balzac. He took refuge, in a sense, in the tale and for the calamity which was perhaps in store for him and did not in any case cease to alarm him. He had the consolation of finding in his own anxiety what Swan and also saint -Loup would have called something quite Balzacian. And Proust uses something else in the novella to, to underscore Monsieur de Charlie's feminine, uh, feminine side. Uh, the princess, of course, takes, uh, is, is, takes the, the highest interest in the selection of her dresses. And when Charles compliments Albertine on her costume, he does so not only by comparing her dress to a dress that the Princess de Cadignan wore, but he has the designs and the colors so graved in his mind that he could, can go on with a lot of details. And Monsieur Charles was the only person capable of appreciating clothes at their true value at a glance his eye detected what constituted their rarity, justified their price. He would never have said the name of one stuff instead of another, and could always tell who had made them. Now, the woman in Charlus is a good, generous, gentle woman, as is proved by his patience and his, his sweetness towards Albertine. When Charlus is in his Saint-Simon mode, I always think he's rather comical and ridiculous, but when he is in his Balzac mode, he's very moving. I think that the reading of Balzac, the homosexual reading of Balzac, is very, very close to the heart of Proust. Uh, later on in the novel, when uh, Charles uh, gets old and loses his grips on reality, he then is, uh, of course, then he reminds one of another Balzac character, the Baron Hulot. The Baron Hulot is one of the main characters of the novel called La Cousine Bette. And Hulot, like Charlus, succumb to their vices. In the case of Hulot, Hulot destroys his reputation, his career, his fortune, his family. And in the case of Charlus, uh, it brings along the collapse of his uh, position in society and his rather humiliating uh, reliance on uh, Jupien. But I think that literary keys can only go so far. And I think one should never forget that in the end, it is uh, the author's talent, imagination, sensitivity that, is ne uh, that, are, necessary, that are the main ingredient in the creation of a complex character. I said earlier that, uh, uh, that Proust was so worried about uh, the fact that Charles would seem so scandalous and that he would uh, sort of uh, disgust his readers. In fact, this worry never stopped, even though he was such a bestseller. Actually, I think it, it reached a sort of paranoia uh, later in his life. In very late in 1921, he wrote to one of his friends, you'll see, when Monsieur de Charlus comes on the scene, everyone will turn their backs to me, especially the English. 
And he wrote to his brother that he would probably have to return his cross of the Légion d'honneur, the highest the civil decoration, the, the French, France's highest civil decoration. On I'll say it in French. On ne m'a pas encore retiré ma croix de chevalier, mais cela viendra peut-être. <laughs> of course, his fears were completely unfounded. Uh, he remained a bestseller in France. He was an immediate success in England. Scott Moncrief started the translation practically uh, upon uh, the, the publication of the book. And Sidney Schiff, uh, the critic, praised precisely what Proust feared would make the English shun his book. In my opinion, the portrait of Charles is Proust's greatest triumph, first among equals in a gallery of masterpiece. And Proust, who never lost his sense of humor, admitted that, the, uh, that society ladies had a very mild reaction to his book. Perhaps, he wrote, this was because they did not understand what they read. <laughs> or perhaps they realized that the actual number of homosexuals was greater in real life than in my novel, where at least people like Cotard, Elstir, Bergod, Norpois maintain the tradition of what was used to be deemed normal. Curiously, he omits Swan in this enumeration. But I find this overreaction of Proust quite fascinating. Because, I mean, Vautrin is no angel. I mean, there was never any question that Balzac's readers would be turned off. I mean, most great literary characters are terrible. I mean, do, do, do you really want to go and spend a weekend with the Karamazovs? <laughs> but still, I mean, you're going to read the book, and you might even have wanted to meet Dostoevsky. I mean, why was Proust so, so overwrought by all this business? I think it has to do with the fact that he put a lot of himself in Charles and didn't necessarily like what he saw. Don't forget that he also wrote that it is only in his work that the artist shows his, uh, his inner self, his hidden self, the self that is never exposed in everyday life. And it is true that Charles has uh, Charles has Proust's amazing uh, literary sensitivity, but they also share rather repellent uh, sexual uh, habits. Uh, remember all the scenes of voyeurism in Jupien's brothel? Well, uh, Proust frequented male brothels also, and it is well known that he liked to look on unobserved. Actually, his presence at a brothel was, uh, is, uh, is certified by a police report. He was an habitué of the establishment of a man called Albert Le Cusia. Albert Le Cusia, that is not without reminding me a bit of Jupien, uh, started out life as a servant in the employ of, uh, Count Ra uh, of Prince Razzeville and Count Grefful. Of course, Proust knew these uh, aristocrats quite well and uh, went to their salon quite regularly and met Le Cusia there as a servant. He continued to see Le Cusia when Le Cusia left and started on his own. He, 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 uh, he organized his little establishment with the financial help of friends. And Proust went there all the time. Uh, the police report dates from one evening during the war. And I think the timing is important because you remember the big sadomasochistic scene in the novel, at the end of the novel, where Charles is beaten by the men uh, armed with chains at, uh, at Jupien's brothel and is spied upon the narrator. Well, that happens during the war. You know, it's preceded by this amazing description of Paris streets in the dark during the war. Well, the police raided uh, Le Cusia's establishment, not so much, not because of the sex, the sex was perfectly legal, as long as minors were not involved. What was illegal, curiously, was the serving of liquor at night, because that had been forbidden during the war, and Le Cusia served liquor. So Le Cusia was the sole responsible, but still all the clients were named in the police report, much to the shame of, of uh, Proust, who had been so secretive about his personal life 
or I mean, he had always been secretive. The, the guilt associated with homosexuality had always weighed very, very heavily on, on Proust. And I do think that he realized that he had let too much of himself in Charlus. And uh, so that caused his anguish when he sent off his character in the world. Thank you.